If you could just say who you are uh, and if you have organisational affiliation Thanks. where you're from. Uh, Terry Gibson, uh, Global Network for Disaster Reduction. Uh, I think this is great because we have been working on trying to work out how to strengthen in our network, which is global, but which is made up of national members, that kind of national level. So um, when someone in our ADRN passed me to this, I read it avidly, and I think it's a really good report, so thanks very much. Uh, so a couple of comments and then a question. Um, the comment I want to add is about the time dimension of networks. Um, because we've learned over the five years or so we've been functional and we've been looking around at other networks that some of the things that Kim's highlighted are things that change in character over the development of a network mm. and, and this is supported by work other people have done. So leadership, which Nigel mentioned, there's a lot of evidence that as you start up a network you need very strong leadership. Um, you probably also therefore tend to have a hub and spoke centralised structure but evidence of a lot of networks shows there needs to be a transition um, from that centrally led structure which mobilizes the network to either a decentralized or distributed form um, which enables it to maintain its vibrancy and energy and the ownership of its members otherwise that recipe which is great for starting it becomes a recipe for failure yeah um, you know so so some of these factors change and indeed the network functions approach we made um, really good use of as we established our network more recently revisiting it we found it less useful because the questions it asks unless you're seriously dysfunctional become less the core of the answers you're looking for mm. and I spoke to someone doing quite an in-depth consultancy for a network who said he found the same thing mm -hmm. that, the, that approach seemed to be more appropriate in the inception of a network so I just make those points about leadership, associated governance, which needs to go through a transition. And those are lessons certainly we're learning and we see that other people have learned. And then I guess my question, which probably touches partly on what Catherine was saying, is about this whole question of how a network develops that strength of trust and cohesiveness so it can then do this surge stuff she was talking about, which I'm not very familiar with surges, but um, I understand what you're saying. And, and I'm heading towards a question here because I think there's a catch-22 because to develop that cohesiveness and trust depends on all sorts of skills of collaboration, facilitation. Uh, Nigel was talking about coaching effectively. Uh, things which are typical of development operators. They're into participation and all that stuff. But what you're asking about is humanitarian networks and humanitarian operators tend to be, we've got to do it yesterday, people, who don't have that kind of patience. So my question is, are humanitarian operators capable of building effective networks? Thank you very much. We'll take a couple more. Um, my name is Rabia Yazbek. I'm a researcher on around uh, legitimacy and accountability. And uh, you've, uh, in, you've mentioned uh, something around about uh, credibility and about uh, accountability issues. And uh, I've done research in the Middle East with uh, inter... Um, I've done some research around um, accountability and not necessarily in the humanitarian sector but around NGOs in the Middle East in general. And something I found very important is that uh, one of the main driver for uh, these NGOs to associate themselves or get involved with networks, local networks, is to support their le legitimacy. And uh, uh, not necessary to to access knowledge or, or or build trust or or even resources like financial resources is actually uh, mainly is is uh, re uh, revolving around associational legitimacy and also uh, another aspect that was very important is around negotiated accountability is to affect uh, uh, or change uh, accountability expectations and 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 reframe or uh, uh, legitimacy arguments and so my question is, like in this 
uh, does this research uh, also highlight this, this important point as a driver for members to associate themselves or get involved with uh, uh, these local networks? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, let's make a start with those as a, as a gateway. Um, can humanitarians um, build networks, uh, develop the sense of trust that's required? Um, and maybe that, that the, the roots of that question also go back into this sort of the, the, the tension that, that Kim um, and Catherine were both talking about, about humanitarian networks that are actually perceived by externals as humanitarian networks, but perceived by, by people on the ground as just networks uh, which have a humanitarian function. So, so can humanitarians do this? Um, and then, uh, you know, what, what did we find about the drivers? Why, why were people engaged in this, this issue of, of legitimacy? Um, maybe, we could, maybe we could start with the second question, uh, the question of legitimacy. Maybe I could ask that to, to Kazi in the first instance. Is this something that you find uh, your 23 members, why are they joining your network, Niripad? And, and is, the, is, is showing their legitimacy a part of that? No, <laughs> it's, it's, it's too difficult to uh, ask it because of uh, the, the, um, how the Nirapod is uh, emerged because of being a partner of Care Bangladesh, uh, Care Bangladesh, they formed a network within themselves. So they shared their knowledge. So they are uh, initially committed and now they are committed to run this network. Uh, after that, we have few members added. Uh, but but uh, they have lots of work to do. So they have committed, uh, but but uh, they have all the own own way of managing them, their own organization. Thank you, thank you, Kazi. Um, Kim, maybe maybe you could talk a little bit more about this issue of legitimacy and also about what it, why why did you find people were joining these networks? Yeah, I think. Um, hmm. The, the national and local organizations that I spoke to almost universally felt marginalized. There, there were exceptions, the organizations like BRAC, the, you know, the really big players who, who don't, but a lot of them, you know, they feel like they're, they're not seen as legitimate and they're seen as they're not seen as credible. And it was interesting to see that um, there was, for those that were engaged in humanitarian response, you see the, the the copy of the HAP standards on the shelf, and you see the the, the sphere standards in, in the office, and you see how people are really keen in engaging with those mechanisms, which they see as building their credibility to external actors. And um, some of them are interested in building their own networks around uh, around um, uh, around HAP, for instance, in Bangladesh, um, and in some ways more enthusiastic than some of the international actors. And they certainly see engaging with networks as a way to boost their credibility. Uh, and I think it was less pronounced, but on the flip side of that, talking to some of the international actors, Nigel mentioned how daunted those involved in UN coordination are about the plethora of national actors that they're supposed to be engaging with in response. And I spoke, um, I remember speaking to a um, head of a OCHA sub-office sub in Mindanao in the Philippines, and he was really keen in the, in the role that the existing uh, national networks could play for him as acting as a, as a gatekeeper, kind of, for, for, for him to be able to access uh, legitimate uh, national actors. He said that basically he didn't have the, the time or the resources or the knowledge to be able to appraise the legitimacy of those organizations himself. And so he was drawing on existing networks that were seen as credible to provide that function for him. And he was doing that informally. Um, but I think there's certainly scope for that to become a more formalized function uh, that these national networks play. And that, in many ways, would be more productive than uh, these structures continuing to exist in parallel or international actors trying to develop their own uh, structures to improve legitimacy at the national level. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, any, 
Any thoughts, Catherine, on, on that particular question before we move on to the question of trust building? Um, yeah, uh, indeed. I think um, I think legitimacy is an important um, gain to be had from um, from networks. I think it is only a gain a gain to be had if the networks themselves are requiring um, some degree of, of ownership or, or commitment or standards or what have you from the members. I mean, simply sort of joining any network and then being sort of legitimate as a consequence won't give you the gains that that legitimacy, you know, the access, the, the access to coordination. Um, so I think things like accountability, you know, down to beneficiary communities in itself is an important component of that discussion about legitimacy. National and local actors, as much as international actors, have to be legitimate on the basis of their, their accountability and engagement and account, um, downwards to the beneficiary and affected communities. Um, but I do, I do very much, um, I sort of get, this is a personal, I should probably be quite clear that I'm being personal here, I do get really sort of quite riled about, you know, um, well, and I, I've met, you know, UN staff as well in the course of my research who, who sort of lament how difficult and frustrating their lives are made by these, you know, countless numbers of local and national actors and how difficult it is. And, and I can appreciate it, it is, but it's also the job and it's also what needs to be done and it is also, um, you know, the, the, you know, the way that the system is going to have to work if we're going to really face the, you know, the, the needs of the, of the risk management and disaster response in, tw in 20 years' time. I think it's really, it's really interesting that they, you know, he talked about he doesn't have the time and the resources or the knowledge, but time and resources and, and knowledge cost money. Somebody has to be funding. If they're going to go to the networks and ask the networks to play some of that role, which could be a really good supportive role, that f needs to be funded. That is time and resources that somebody needs to be funding and needs to be giving sufficient weight to to be reckon, you know, to, to be validated. If it's not, you know, if it's not being funded because the UN don't have time to do it, then somebody needs to be funding either them to do it and have the time to do it, or the systems and structures that then they are going to to do it on their behalf. Otherwise, it, it, otherwise it falls into this trap that you see in in sort of partnership discussions and, and that we recognise all the time that is. Um, international players having money to do what they want um, and, and the pie getting cut sl smaller and smaller so that local and national staff and agencies are doing very significant jobs for very little money and, and filling everything in, in in a lot of time. So some of that is my own um, uh, personal, personal reflections on, on, on some of that language, I think, but um, hopefully some important kind of questions there as well. Thank you. Before we move to Terry's question, did you have a, a feeling around the, the issue of uh, accountability, legitimacy, joining networks for legitimacy? Um, well, yes, I mean, clearly I think it's true. <laughs> I mean, I, and, and we do it too. I mean, we, you know, I don't think it's a them and us thing. I think we all, we all seek to join networks that give us greater legitimacy in the eyes of someone, whoever that someone is. Um, I mean, for, uh, well, um, Terry posed the question, can humanitarians form networks? I mean, in the space of 20 seconds, I wrote down, so as Oxfam, we're a member of Oxfam International, which is our kind of our family, which is a network we spend enormous amounts of time and energy on. You've got the Disasters Emergencies Committee, which is about trying to get credibility in front of the British public. Um, there's ICFA, which is about credibility at the Geneva Forums. You've got SCHR, there's ALNAP. Um, there's a Humanitarian Accountability Partnership. Um, bond, people in aid, voice, interaction in the US, and that's in the space of 20 seconds. And if you take it down to regional and national levels, you get the Sahel Working Group, and I don't know how many different kind of ECB, although that's now sort of rest in peace. But you know, uh, <laughs> there was, you know, I think we form networks all the time, and I think it's as true for the international agencies as much as the local agencies. It's about trying to gain legitimacy in the eyes of some audience. Um, often it's about generating resources, um, but, it, but you only generate resources if you have legitimacy. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a two-way two -way street there, I think. Um, I think maybe the subtle, the, the subtle difference isn't that humanitarians struggle to form networks. As I say, we form <laughs> milieu. Um, but it's that surge element. And I would contend networks don't surge, organizations do. Um, so I, I don't think any network can surge, as you can have a group of people who, perhaps enabled by the network because of the relationships they've be built between themselves, are know each other better. They might have pre-agreed some um, 
ways of working together. I know in Indonesia there was a lot of work done around joint needs assessments and having common formats for making assessments so you could speed up decision making and that sort of thing. But essentially, it's still the organisations that do the surge. Um, so networks are enablers; they don't replace. Would be would be my contention. Could we could we move then to Terry's Terry's question? Um, maybe yeah. back to you, Catherine. Can can humanitarians build trust or catalyse the building of trust in networks? Um, I uh, this an area that came out very strongly in in our research for building the future of humanitarian aid. Um, particularly looking at partnerships in emergencies, is that it's very difficult to start a partnership or, or to have trust, or, you know, or, sorry, in this, or to build trust or develop trust at the point, you know, after, after an emergency started and you're in the midst of a response. Um, it's a very, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to, to you, because of these questions of time and, and stress. And so... Uh, I think that's what your 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 question is trying to get at. That is, it, is it, um, what our research showed is that therefore, in order to have that trust, you you know, the whole system needs to be front loading. The whole set. I mean, this this whole thing about the shifting of the reorientation of the humanitarian system is also a fundamental financial discussion about the interaction between development and humanitarian work. So, you know, if humanitarians are concerned with disaster risk, disaster management, and response. Then yes, they can be in, be involved in building trust and all that stuff because they're doing it way before there's an emergency and way you know after the emergency. But when they're doing it, then they're not humanitarians; they're development people, or the language sort of changes. So, I think um, you know the overwhelming the overwhelming message from from our research was that um, that investment, that substantial kind of inter, uh, integration, needs to happen so that that trust can be built, those relationships can be built, um, and, and I guess in this sense, those relationships across networks and, and the functions and systems and forms of the network can be built so that they're ready and primed, one would hope, and prepared with, you know, to enable during this response phase. And that's where I, could, I can see and have, heard, you know, seen examples of, of enabling surge, perhaps for want of a better word, in which, you know, member agencies can surge accompaniment to other member agencies, um, particularly in a national context in which an, um, uh, you know, an, an intensive or, or risk is being felt in, in, or an intensive crisis being felt in a particular area, but, but the other regional partner is, is not experiencing it and then they can surge across the nation. Um, yeah, I th I, but I, I think it comes back down to sort of this fundamental front-loading and, and interaction with development debates and, and language and financing and and what have you. Kazi, we can't, we can't see you, but I think we can hear you. Um, it would be very interesting to know what your experience has been of, of working with uh, international humanitarians and also to know um, what has Niripad found works in terms of building trust in a fairly large network. Any thoughts you had on that? Ah, okay. Okay, we'll have to we'll have to wait for Kazi to come back onto that. While we do, um, I just wanted to send the question back um, to find to ask about your work in the in the Middle East. Um, presumably, organisations gain legitimacy from joining networks that have legitimacy. Did you did you find anything about what it takes for a network to build its legitimacy as a network? Did, was there anything there? Um. No, not really, because that wasn't the focus of the of the research. The focus was more on the uh, individual NGOs, and it's actually it, that was a finding that we found, that, but what was it actually originally also uh, uh, planned? And um, but um, um, well, articulating about about the subject. Um, there is, a, there is a. We found definitely uh, also in the theoretical basis for this, there is a direct links between uh, legitimacy and uh, resource acquisition and uh, uh, acquiring resources. And uh, uh, but my question was more about how these organisations were actually interested to join these networks because they were they found it's not only to gain legitimacy but also to change 
and reframe the legitimacy arguments and, and accountability's expectations. So like setting standards are affecting these standards on a domain level. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, but at the same time, also one of the driver is also to gain legitimacy. And I'm talking here about upward legitimacy uh, toward the donors mainly, and and also downward, especially for NGOs who are operating businesses like social enterprises, etc. Because there is a um, tension between the commercial and the and uh, the social aim. So. Uh, by associating themselves with these networks, also it provides them with certain legitimacy to uh, profit, to to, mm -hmm. to make profits and uh, to support their uh, financial bottom line. Thank you. Maybe we can come back to this issue um, of uh, particularly of you know what it what it is that the, the NGOs in the study had or the organisations in the study what had led them to join the networks and how they were doing this balance between. Um, getting and giving in the network in a minute. But first, let's take some more questions. Um, I'm Lucy Moore. I'm from Islamic Relief. I'm the Senior Policy Advisor on Conflict Transformation. Um, I just wondered, having not actually read the report yet, um, whether or not um, anything came out about value judgments on which of those six different functions of networks um, because one thing I'm quite interested in is the overburdening of networks that you know networks get set up and then suddenly you know the small thing that you, with all the best will in the world you start off with a relatively constrained um, purpose but it can become overburdened with the desire to have it cover more and more different things and I wondered if any you know first of all if any value judgment had been made between those different types of networks and also how organizations you were looking at networks you were looking at were dealing with overburdening of the networks thank you Lucy we'll take another question ma'am Many Asian countries are towards the bottom when you have many world reports on various aspects. And we know that the Southern Hemisphere has a lot of problems. And uh, um, recently, uh, Professor Rothberg and others who have been doing uh, international development for five, six decades have decided that no, this is not working. We have uh, plowed in uh, billions of pounds or dollars or whatever, we need to, or the whole problem lies in the leadership and they have started African Leadership Academy now. That is uh, um, Asia, I, I, <laughs> I only wrote to him saying, oh, when are you going to start one for Asia? But uh, there are huge problems. Just uh, take one example. Last week we had two reports, uh, one on corruption, um, and then uh, in, uh, Transparency International uh, released one report, and then one on rape. Um, these are just two examples, but there are humor, numerous concepts. Um, and uh, there's huge problem in Asia, Asian countries. So this may be, uh, this network may be uh, just beginning to develop into a stronger one when they look at various uh, vertical and horizontal, they uh, um, enclose uh, various uh, vertical and horizontal uh, levels uh, into them. There can be improvement in the lives uh, and uh, aid, I mean aid, everywhere, uh, everywhere you go, uh, there are so many meetings and they all say, oh, 50 years of uh, aid hasn't produced much uh, effect. But we need to tackle the root cause. If they are going to tackle leadership, we can go from top bottom to us. But we can also start from bottom upwards. So this sort of network will do the uh, opposite of what Rothberg is trying to do. Uh, so this is uh, some good news for me. Thank you very much. Should we take one more? We'll go to that in a minute. Okay. Um, 
Francesca Volino, the research officer um, in ALNAP, I'm covering evaluation, and the question is about the m &E function in network. So Kim highlighted that this is indeed um, a, problematic, a problematic function, I suppose, to examine. And I wanted to ask whether um, in the network that you have examined, you have seen the allocation of role and responsibility relating to the monitoring function, allocating space for this to happen, whether you have seen that this is something that is uh, uh, located in the center of the network, if there is a secretariat, or if there are some interesting examples of when the monitoring and evaluation function is decentralized, perhaps among partners, whether there is some peer learning happening, perhaps some of, uh, um, in some of the network members um, looking, uh, looking at the MNE function reflecting on the networks and how they operate. Thank you, Francesca. Maybe we'll take the panel from the left to the right. Um, and. Uh, Addressing those those questions which which speak most to your interests, um, uh, Lucy was was asking about um, value judgments around the, the various different network functions, um, and which of these functions were valued the most, or, or which of these functions seem to be working. You know, when when networks have many many different things put upon them. Um, going back to this this very interesting idea um, about the degree to which networks can actually create change, create political change, advocate for change, uh, and the degree to which we've seen that in these humanitarian networks and in other networks that we've been, we've been involved in. And what does it take to make that happen, perhaps? Uh, and then finally, um, question about M&E, the M&E of networks. Um, you know, where, is, where is it happening and, and where in the, in the network is it happening? Kim, quite a smorgasbord of, yeah. of ideas there. Uh, uh, we didn't apply, there was no hierarchy in the functions that, that, that we used. Uh, I guess the only sort of uh, implicit one is between the community building and convening function where you'd say that uh, convening is a more sophisticated and difficult function than building a community and where the difference is between whether the actors are um, homogenous or heterogeneous. But we didn't, we didn't uh, have a, a value judgment there and I don't think many of the people we spoke to, I mean, we, the way the, the methodology worked is we didn't present people with those functions and ask them to apply their work to them. We asked them about their work and then mapped that against the functions. So it depended on what they were doing, largely. Um, it, but the, the question of overburdening was a real, was a real one. I think um, the example that springs to mind is Akbar in Afghanistan, which was formed in 1988 to, to facilitate exchange cross-border to refugees and had then, over the the subsequent decades taken on a whole range of different functions and grown hugely in size. And one of the factors we have for success is being, you know, um, cognizant of, of, of the size of a network and recognizing that as, as a network grows, the, the ties will necessarily weaken because just because of questions of scale. And so that will impact on the nature of the functions it performs. And so that's a real consideration um, if a network is growing about how that affects not just resourcing, but essentially the things it can do and the things it can't do. Um, and, and issues to do with trust. Um, so uh, that's what I'd say to that. Uh, on the question of, of leadership and change, I mean, w um, we, uh, ALNAP, um, has had ongoing conversations with other networks outside of Asia, um, with the African Center for Humanitarian Action based in Addis and the emerging um, uh, African NGO task force uh, which is a, a network of UNHCR national partners across Africa. Um, and we did, and uh, we, w we had considered working with them, but actually we found that the networks in Asia were more advanced and were more developed and there was more happening. And I think this is slightly a uh, different point, but certainly uh, it's my view that the development of networks such as ADRN at the regional level are in part a a response to the increased regional activity of Asian governments around these similar issues around development and response through uh, ASEAN and, and other mechanisms. Um, so, um, so yeah, I mean, it seems to me that uh, in that respect, at least, uh, Asia's ahead of Africa uh, uh, more advanced uh, at this particular given time and in that area. On the quick. Sorry, there's a huge gap between the countries among Asia itself. Sure. Uh, and in the three case studies we looked at, yeah. And I think that's one of the things that uh, ADRN is really interested in, is how it can draw on the experience of its members at the, at the national level to inform it at the regional level and to share between the national members so that those 
they aren't happening in isolation, that to move from what has been for ADRN a, a hub and spoke model, where they have bilateral relationships with their national members to a more distributed model where their members can work together. And there are examples, uh, this, these aren't, this is outside the case studies we looked at, so it's not in the report, but there are examples, for instance, of teams of technical experts going from, uh, I think, India to Afghanistan uh, to assist partner agencies and things like that happening, beginning to happen. Um, but that was slightly outside the scope of the paper. Uh, on M&E, uh, I saw almost no M and very, very little E. Um, I didn't, I don't think I saw any networks that had an explicit M&E function. And where evaluations had taken place, I think it had exclusively been international organizations who had been funding networks as part of larger programs conducting evaluations, whether that was of um, ongoing uh, risk reduction and response programs. So Christian Aid had a uh, building disaster resilient communities program in the Philippines, which was evaluated. And as a part of that, it, uh, it evaluated some of the networks that it was supporting uh, and similar work on uh, other networks. But that was all external agencies, uh, international agencies who were involved in the networks rather than the networks themselves. It's a real gap, but, um, but it's not a surprising gap at the same time. I don't think that they're not <laughs> not concentrating on these things when they're many of them struggling to function and be sustainable. Uh. Thanks. Um, yeah, so um, overburdening or, or mission creep, um, yeah, clear risk. <laughs> uh, and I think a lot of this boils down to there's an interesting interplay for me between networks, usually you get networks of organisations, but in practice it's networks of individuals making these things work or, or not work. Um, and a lot of this boils down to leadership, not necessarily the formal leadership, although that may be the case, but there's a lot of informal leadership that goes on as well, and who are the voices in the room arguing either for taking on a different thing, uh, a different activity, or indeed sort of keeping true to the original purpose. I suspect, although I've not done any M&E on this, um, that the clearer the purpose and the more that is stuck to, the more successful I, I can imagine a network being, um, but that, but yeah, it's a risk. And I, I think it's one of those things in which healthy, mature networks constantly talk to themselves, um, and as the environment changes, the, you know, they discuss these issues and they take on some new things and they drop some things, um, you know, and it boils down to the strength or quality of the of the governance governance function. M and E, yeah, often often extremely weak. Well, I mean, Kim, Kim's given the answer. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't say anything else. There was a third question. Yes, uh, just sort of around this issue, which has come up in several cases, but around the issue of um, networks and their role in um, creating change at the, oh sort yeah. of at the political and social level. Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, for many, many networks, that's their raison d'etre. Um, I mean, in, in the sort of humanitarian sector, you might look at, say, Sphere. Um, sphere, you know, born out of um, a frustration with our collective performance in Rwanda, the feeling that actually if we were more articulate and clear about what the implications of rights in a disaster context meant and you could, um, you know, codify that, then you could use that as a means of shaping donor policy, practice and approach. So we now find donors saying, we want you to achieve Sphere standards. In, you know, so that was, a, you know, very much so, that was the intent. And obviously in the political arena, you've got, you know, recently we've had the IF campaign here in the UK, which was very specifically about mobilising public support and, and, and shaping policy. So, and yeah, absolutely. And I think they're, you know, probably the most successful way of achieving that sort of change. Um, I'm just going to jump straight to the M&E because I, I find that quite interesting and also probably very, very important, and I was reminded um, about a, a, a report, uh, what's the word, I can't remember, so project report form, we were looking at our work in the Philippines, and we were looking at and talking with uh, uh, the funding, we were looking at the funding for the DRR net, and the, um, and the DRR net were, as you know from the example in the report, um, heavily involved in lobbying and advocating for the disaster risk reduction law to be passed in the Philippines. And this, 
this piece of work, which uh, a considerable amount of work was done, um, I have, you know, brilliantly by some of Christian Aid's partners who were funded to be part of that network, and that network as a much broader whole did help and deliver a disaster risk reduction law which will impact 80 million people in the Philippines. But this report had said impact. 80 million, I said the, our money had saved the lives of 80 million <laughs> Philippines. You know, and we were like, bro, this is good. Anyway, it was, I think it was you know, a very good example and slightly ironic. I'll, I'll start, you know, Alan was uh, tasked to do this quite late at night and be like, come on, what, what, you know, give me some indicate. And he's like, 80 million people say. And I was like, great. But, um, but obviously, and slightly ironically, because of the difficulties of attribution. And we see this with advocacy. I work, you know, quite a lot in terms of advocacy and policy. And you see real difficulties in, in attributing change and attributing impact to your own work as part of a very big whole. And that's, a, 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 you know, holistic approach. So that is w why I think networks are so difficult in terms of evaluating. But I don't think that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Um, and I think this is a really good example of the kind of thing that, you, you know, that, that, that people, you know, we, we work with our staff to try and do. Um, we, you know, Christian Aid does fund members who are partner, part of networks to be, you know, and in, to be part of those networks. And host bodies of networks to do that role. And we have to try and quantify and capture what they're doing and what that's delivering um, to, to be accountable to that funding and to, to, to why we, we've taken those choices and whether it, we think it's effective and have those discussions. Um, uh, I'm not involved in all of those uh, discussions, so I'd better just uh, back off a little bit there about where, where it does or doesn't work. But I think it really is an interesting uh, area when it comes back down to um, you know it costs time resources and knowledge so let's let's try and, and quantify that if, if people are, if some people are saying they don't have the time resources and knowledge then we know that there is a, there is a, a cost implication there we know that that could be very useful if it's doing something so where it exists what is it doing and, and what is the impact and how can we quantify that and then I think we do get into a very very much more constructive area about what needs financing up front so you you know so your trust building what that's delivering and how that's you know contributing at the point of response you know this discussion about shifting uploading the financing to, to for disaster prevention um you know and into the development realm or whatever or this integration between development and humanitarian sphere if we want to be getting into that debate we need to be able to at least start answering and debating some of those questions even if in that debate we might challenge some of the traditional questions of um, you know, indicators and evidence or, or evidence of impact and, and want, want to have a bit of a debate about that. That's what I'll say on that one. Can I just make a comment on monitoring and evaluation? Um, just wait for me. Uh, very briefly, which is, I think, while the kind of, if you like, traditional monitoring and evaluation is difficult, organisational learning is very possible and very important as an attribute of networks um, because if, if networks are prepared to learn through reflection and through saying to each other, did that work, didn't it work, what should, what should we do differently, then they can move along a dynamic trajectory and improve their performance. Uh, whereas trying to map a network across a log frame or something like that can be pretty challenging. So I'd just say, you know, learning's quite key in effective monitoring and evaluation of networks to actually make them fly. Thank you. Uh, before we come to Wendy, I'm just going to take a couple of, uh, of virtual questions, long, long distance questions. Uh, Joseph, uh, thank you, Joseph. Uh, Joseph's um, writing from the European Research Centre for Information Systems. Um, and uh, with quite a number of questions, thank you. I'm not sure we can do justice to all of them. Um, but I think we'll probably go with Just the easy ones. The easy ones, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> with a question specifically about the clusters, um, because this is something which I believe came up in the report, particularly in Afghanistan. Uh, and, and Joseph is asking, what's being done to manage the complexity inherent in matching members of cluster system with technical partners, the private sector, and frontline community initiatives. So, so how we, we, we talked earlier on, of course, about you know you might have a hundred different organisations or more than a hundred organisations, and not just traditional international organisations, but other uh, private sector and other actors. Um, what what 
how, uh, what is the current activity and what is the potential of networks uh, in coordinating this? Um, and how does that relate to the clusters? Uh, a second question from Crystal, Crystal Miskovich, a PhD student um, in systems engineering and knowledge management. Uh, I think this one actually is down to you, Nigel, in the first instance. Uh, someone mentioned weak organisations in a network will not create an effective network. Um, how would you, in this context, how would you, how would you describe a weak organisation? Um, and as a rider to that, a, a weak organisation with response to, to uh, in, in a context of natural disaster, um, and what is the role of the network in developing individual member organisations, if any? So, the role of, of networks as potential coordinating mechanisms for very heterogeneous members, how that relates to the clusters, uh, and also the role of networks in developing what is a weak organisation and what can networks do to develop that? Anybody? You brought so up the weak organisations, yeah, 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 <laughs> I better dive in. Um, I guess what I, was, what I meant by that was you know, networks are not magic circles. <laughs> they, they, you know, they don't just magically make you better. And in the way that I think most people would see teamwork as a good way of working and that effective teams will achieve more than a group of individuals, I'm sure we have all had experience of bad teams. <laughs> so because teamwork is a good thing and good teams achieve amazing things, it is not true to say all teams are all brilliant. And I think that's true of networks, actually. You know, networking is very effective for a number of the things we've talked about, managing upwards, changing policy, getting legitimacy, but it is not a given that simply by forming a network one achieves all those things. You, there's a bit of, you know, one has to make a choice on those things. So, so I suppose what I was meaning was um, if you have weak organisations, and, and weak might be weak in any area you choose to d discern, simply linking them does not magically make them better. Hmm. Um, I, I think there is potential there but that potential needs to be explored. Now, obviously, those organisations then have the opportunity to grow and develop together. Um, so that was all I was meaning, I think. Yeah. Um, and in relation to clusters, um, I don't honestly know quite where Okta are at on, on some of that thinking specifically to the question, but I suppose, in, in my head at least, there is a potential there, that particularly, and the, the point Catherine was making about sort of trying to get a lot more of this thinking upstream rather than in the disaster, but pre the disaster, to known hazards and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I think you know if you have well-established networks of organizations who are plugged into the government structures, who know the offices of the National Disaster Management Authority, who are familiar with the legislation, who have you know connections to local regional government and, and so on and so forth, then I would have thought managing a cluster with those kind of networks is going to be easier than arriving in country and finding, you know, 100 people in front of your desk saying, what do we do? Mm. So, yeah. Thank you. Catherine, any? Um, I'm not sure I have, I have loads to say. I mean, in terms of the relationship with clusters, so on, on the role of, on the question of weak members, I don't particularly have loads to say, so I'll, I'll leave that with what Nigel said. But, um, you know, I, I think there is, uh, you know, the example of Haiti is, you know, and I talked when I was... Uh, doing the, the case study for our report, I went out and did quite a few interviews. And, you know, in the end, it's not that there weren't networks in Haiti at the time, it's that, you know, for various reasons, the, um, the networks were there were, were kind of um, in excluded and, you know, uh, in part, and then and then kind of were brought back into some of the, the discussions. Um, and I think different clusters worked, worked in different ways. Um, there's a lot of learning that's kind of come out of that, but I think uh, it would be interesting to see now in the context of Syria whether and how um, any of that learning is kind of being applied. Uh, and I think I suppose it comes back to this point about how can how can networks that are there um, yeah, li yeah liaise with the clusters in a way that that's useful. Um, yeah, I probably don't really have anything to add more than what you said. I just realised maybe I won't answer that question. <laughs> I kind of agree with Nigel and was going to kind of say what he said, and then he said it. So then I, I, I really don't have anything to add. Thank you. <laughs> uh, on the on the clusters, I thought I, the, 
the specific question was about what's happening in the clusters to match resources with technical capacities. Is that right? Yes. The the um, Jodis starts by asking what's being done to manage the complexity inherent in matching the members of cluster systems with technical partners, the private sector, and frontline initiatives. Well, I would say I don't think much is, and I'm not sure that that's their intent. And um, with the risk of defending OCHA twice on one day, they, you know, they're supposed to be response focused, and so I'm not sure that they are the best place to build those long-term relationships. Mm. That might be something that takes place in other structures, such as yeah. national networks. Um, I mean, what what I saw happening um, in uh, in the three case study contexts, it was quite different. But in most of those instances, there were there was an assumption that international NGOs would act to bring national voices to the table by proxy by representing their partners. That was the assumption. I'm not saying that that was what was happening, but that, that seemed to be, you know, INGOs have partners that they can represent the views of their partners in, in the HCT or in specific clusters, or specific clusters might have national members. Some instances in, uh, in the Bangladesh where it's a quasi uh, cluster structure, a national organization has a seat on the equivalent of the HCT and that is presumed to then have a network effect to other national organizations. I'm not entirely sure again if that was actually happening and something similar was happening in the Philippines. So there are attempts being made to link these structures together. Um, the meeting has ended because it had only one participant for the last 30 <laughs> um, minutes. But I think there is a recognition from within OCHA that they don't have a good enough understanding of what's taking place, and the national networks and their members still feel marginalised. But they are, they are, they're not trying to do the same thing, so recognising the things that they're good at and the things they're trying to do, I think, is really, really important. Right. Thank you. Wendy. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted, I had a question and then a, a comment on the moving back to the M&E. I mean, I think it's really important to be clear about what you're trying to monitor and evaluate. Is it the implementation performance of the network as your funded partner? Is it whether the network is meeting its own objectives or its original objectives? Or, or what exactly are you trying to look at? Because in some cases, it may not even be relevant. Because my other question really is that, um, and I don't know, Kim, whether, whether you found this in your uh, research, or it would be interesting to know what your perspective is. But uh, I, mean, I, I wonder whether as international actors in the humanitarian system, whether as soon as we start engaging with national networks, do we then try to reform them in our own image? And you know, is this something that we need to, to think a bit more about? Fascinating question, and one which I think you did you did look at sort of the the uh, it goes back to the the sort of supporting drowning. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I think th that yeah. I th again, I talk about the example of Atbar again, where yeah, that seems to be happening. And um, I was just thinking about Terry's point earlier about the evolution of leadership. You know, I was I I didn't have the benefit of doing this as a longitudinal study, so you know th these things do evolve very much over time. But I think you, you're probably right that people impose expectations and structures on these networks. Um, but I think it's also true to say that the national organizations, as well as seeing the, um, the opportunity to gain legitimacy, see, see also the, the demonstrable value of engaging with international structures and processes to improve their ability to act as, to fulfill their goals. Um, so it's a two-way street, and Paul and I had lots of long conversations about the impact of uh, national culture uh, on the nature of networking, and I think it's a really important, uh, important point, and one that probably we didn't get to go into as much as we'd like to in the, in the study, but there are obvious differences across the case study context. Um, on the point of M&E, yeah, I think identifying exactly what the network is trying to do and finding indicators for that uh, is, is a challenge, and it's going to involve different tools and approaches to you would used for normal program evaluation. Um, the challenge is around, is around attribution and contribution. I was listening to Catherine's example there. When I was in the Philippines, I was asking a lot of people about um, DRRnet, and everyone in the network, people in international organizations that had supported it, uh, and people in the government and other uh, 
uh, state actors that I spoke to all talked about how this network had had a really important influence on changing the disaster response law. And then someone said, oh yeah, and there was the flood. And I said, what flood? And about a year before the law was passed, there'd been an enormous flood that had flooded all of central Metro Manila and had sort of had a huge influence on politicians' desire to be seen to be doing something around disaster risk management. And, you know, disentangling those things is always going to be a really tricky thing to do. If I, if I can jump in on that one, what I think that also in interestingly illustrates is that really effective advocacy is owned by everybody. So when you get, um, and so we, if you do talk to a lot of people, everybody owns, it's, it's, also, it's also that their particular money or their particular role, or I, mean, I'm, I am, so, you know, being slightly exaggerating here, but, you know, was instrumental, was key in delivering, and therefore you can kind of attribute, attribute back. But the, the reality is that, you know, that, that a whole set of circumstances in that context helped deliver a very important piece of legislation, including a flood, you know, and, and, and you get, you know, you see that across, across the board, which I think is, but it is why uh, I very much agree with Wendy. When, when you are being clear about what you're taking ownership or what you're, you know, it's very, the more focused you can be, the clearer you can be about what, if any, difference you made in, in, in delivering that or, 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 you know, what impact you've had. Um, I think, I think it, it's, I think it, it's, a, it's a, a challenge with networks as well because I think um, we talked, to, you know, you, you, you spoke, Kim, about the kind of formal structures that you tried to, to limit your networks to, but we all, we've all been talking about the informal dynamics at play within networks and the informal elements of leadership, relationships, skill sets, um, time, effort, interest, um, individuals, all that sort of stuff. And, and actually, quite a lot of, of that is difficult to, to quantify, but I mean, I don't think that's necessarily any less the case with development per se. Um, I think I think maybe there's there's interesting um, questions to be uh, learned or, or, or areas to be learned from discussions around how do you attribute and, and measure impact in terms of advocacy because I know that well, you know there was a quite a big workshop last year with with Diffid that I you know that where where we looked at how you break down and step back and I think maybe there's quite an interesting aspect in terms of systems learning as well in relationship. To, to networks that could be really, you know, and I'd be interested mm -hmm. to see more on, on how to do that, partly to be thinking through how do we quantify this and, and, and yeah, kind of start start recognising the real fantastic work that's often going on under underreported and undervaluated. Um, is there a danger of reforming networks in our own image? Whether, I mean, I, you know, I, I talked about this tension and I think that is there, this tension between the power of donors to dictate the aims and objectives of the money that they are contributing um, and the influence that they have and can help that network have access to or what have you um, versus, I mean, I think, I think the bigger danger is that, is that money sets up networks. I mean, kind of what you were saying, that money replicates networks and, the, and that actually if donors don't find the kinds of relationships or networks they find useful, they will create them. Um, rather than change, changing what's there, or, or uh, so, so I think that can be a, a real risk um, and one that maybe um, a much stronger, sort of more collaborative um, network is able to, to themselves engage in fending off, perhaps, and, and, and hopefully being involved in that debate with donors about the standards with which they will take money or not take money, or the standards with which they will interact with, you know, and provide services and support for this international sector that's coming to, to work with them or not. And I, I'd, for one, be much more you know, in, interested in, in seeing and, and trying to document some more of that sort of tension and debate, um, also in terms of sharing lesson learning across the different countries and, and regions where, where that has had some success and, and perhaps you know, trying to share that with countries which are, are earlier on in the, in the networking cycle or development particularly in relation to humanitarian response. Nigel, any thoughts on either M&E or, or um, the danger of or the possibilities of recreating networks in the image of northern networks? I, I've already had one stab at this, but... <laughs> um, I don't know, in terms of the uh, recreating in our, in our own image, I guess it's a risk, and I suppose I, I tried to touch on that with what I said about being clear about the incentives one creates. Um, or disincentives one creates. 
Um, I, I d yeah, whether it's an image thing, I think it's about clarity around objective. I think you can see, um, you know, right, so right now here in the UK, there's a lot of work going on within what's called the START network, it was formerly known as the Consortium of British Humanitarian Agencies. And essentially, a, a particular carrot has generated a lot of discussion between agencies about what we could do to collaborate on certain areas of work around, say, for example, capacity building or technical standards. And so I think, um, I, I suppose I'm slightly less cynical that, 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 that it's about creating in our own image. Um, what worries me more about is, is about agendas and is it our agenda rather than a local agenda and are we too busy uh, using our own uh, sort of problem statements and analysis of solutions rather than being willing to listen to what people on the ground living it, breathing it, say are mm. actually the key issues and, and, and problems and things that need to be done. So I think as it's, um, I'm less worried about image as I am about clarity around agenda and purpose and who gets to set that. Thank but you. I think that's, that's the opportunity in networks, is the opportunity in networks is you get to amplify your voice and say, whoa, st stop everyone, you're going down the wrong track you can do this. Um, but there's also risks in that. I mean, it, it, networks are a bit like systems that, you know, they can be negative or they can be positive. So, um, you know, one of the challenges, I think, as a, as a humanitarian sector, but it's, these things are two-sided, is the classic development humanitarian split. In part, that is reinforced and replayed because I think, certainly in my experience, I often know more colleagues working on humanitarian issues from other organisations than I know colleagues in my own organisation. Um, because the, I spend my time in humanitarian networks, so I spend a lot of time meeting other people doing humanitarian work. And I don't actually spend that much time meeting development colleagues. Um, I spend far more time in meetings like this, talking to a bunch of people interested about humanitarianism. So networks can also lock in particular patterns of behaviour mm. and information mm. flow and communication that may actually inhibit some of the cross fertilization we need. So they're, they're kind of these neutral things that can be good or can be bad. It all, all depends on how the people within them use them. Thank you. Kim, I'm going to give the last word to you, if I may, in terms of they can be good or they can be bad. Um, if, if uh, it's slightly unfair, I know, <laughs> but then that won't be the first time. Um, if, uh, if you were to give one piece of advice to, to, to those, maybe perhaps particularly to international organisations who are interested in working with networks or to the networks, the national networks themselves, about what it takes to make it work, what would that be? Yeah, uh, it's very unfair. I have this piece of paper which says, sum up with one key message for international orgs. Uh, and I, I don't think I can, <laughs> frankly. Um, I think where I've seen it working, um, it's, it's about sustained engagement, which isn't controlling and and that means not not being able to set, set the agenda and not really being able to say what success necessarily looks like at the start but having the the confidence to to engage with national organizations trying to do that uh, and not have control thank you very much Kim thanks a lot for presenting the the work to us our panelists thank you very much Nigel Catherine Cassie who unfortunately we lost the link um, thank you very much, all of you, for, for joining us for the discussion. We'd like to invite you to continue the discussion. Uh, there will be some drinks and something to eat next door in room C, just around the corner here. Uh, for those of you online, thank you also for, for joining us. Unfortunately, of course, you can't join us for the drinks. Sorry, it's that way. Uh, you can't join us for the drinks, but maybe if at your desk you would like to open up a packet of crisps and pour yourself a glass of orange juice, you can join us in spirit. Um, have a good weekend, everybody. <laughs>